Hi, everyone. Lovely to see so many of you here today, despite, I guess, having lunch earlier. Um, before we jump into the real topic of network effects, I'd like to uh, give you a quick word on Python Capital, which is Python exactly, not Python. <laughs> and we are named after a rock climbing tool, the one that keeps you safe while you're rock climbing. So no snakes in the office, I promise. And even though quite a few of us can code, we're not that passionate about the Python programming language either. But uh, rock climbing aside, <laughs> we are a London-based venture fund that focuses on online businesses with strong network effects. And very often, these are marketplaces. And you can see that in our portfolio, which spans pretty much the whole spectrum. We have physical goods, we have labor and services, we have content, social, um, we have community, there's data and, and uh, infrastructure. And you will also notice quite a few Polish names on there, I hope. So Doc Planner, Booksy, Allegro. And this is why you can see you know, that Pete, Piton likes the local ecosystem quite a bit. On to today's topic of uh, discussion. Why do we even care so much about network effects? And as a group of you know, marketplace founders and investors in marketplaces, you guys have a lot of understanding and appreciation for this particular slide. High market share leads to superior product by definition, which then leads to high market share. And it's the ultimate winner take all or winner take most. It's highly, highly attractive. And at scale, network effects make these companies very defensible and dominant. And this is what we like. Now, what are some of the lessons we've learned over the years? Number one, capital efficiency is not what it used to be. And while the fundamentals of pre- and post-liquidity network effects haven't changed much, the tactics of getting to critical mass has changed significantly. So the traditional and historical case, marketplaces, network effect businesses were these organic builds where supply and demand gently reinforce each other until critical mass is reached. Since about 2011, we don't no, no longer see that. In fact, we've witnessed a shift towards liquidity buying. And what has changed there again? Well, simply cheap and abundant capital and the realization of how valuable the winner is. As we mentioned, it's a winner take all. As a result, a lot of investors and founders are all of a sudden willing to sacrifice short term unit economics. And in fact, sometimes not just short term. <laughs> so this aggressive approach was initially applied to the proven consumer models and scaling them quickly. So if you think of uh, general classifieds which were copied from one market to the other, so it was basically for that. We then saw the approach being um, applied to B2B, so a more capital intensive model uh, where you need the real sales force. We then saw it being applied to a case when there was already an early leader with strong unit economics and the new company coming in had to catch up. So what they did was undercut. And finally, and sadly, we saw the new approach being applied to business models that made no sense, actually, and network effects that were absolutely dubious. And what are the lessons to be learned here? And what are the key takeaways? Well, in bullish funding environments, markets become unattractive simply because of all the well-funded competitors going at each other. In these capital intensive builds, you need a team, so both founders and investors, that can raise capital better than the competition. And be careful. So unit economics may become irrelevant in the short term, but market economics won't. 
So in other words, you still have to make sure that the cost you paid to acquire the market, i.e. to reach critical mass, is less than the ultimate value of the winner in that market. Because otherwise, you've been purchasing $5 bills with $10 bills, essentially. On to the next lesson, which is all about competition in the world of network effects. And because we're in network effects territory, we talk about pre- and post-liquidity competition. And pre-liquidity is all about whether to enter, and it, when, once you enter, how to stay alive long enough until you build critical mass. Post-liquidity is all about attacking or defending a very attractive castle with a wide moat, which is the network effects. Starting with pre-liquidity, one approach we really like at Piton is the grassroots under the radar screen approach. As a marketplace, as an early stage network effects business, you will be quite vulnerable at the beginning, or at least until you build critical mass. And as we saw, critical mass comes with high relative market share. So one way to speed up the process, and one way to queue jump, essentially, is if you go after a small initial market, what we call the minimum viable market. And there's roughly three types of minimum viable markets. You can go after a sub-market, and here there's many ways to segment, and uh, you can see plenty of examples that are quite successful and you probably know of. So product niche, vertical versus general classifieds. You have value segment, for example, Uber with their luxury segmentation initially. You can go after a demographic, Facebook's initial focus on Harvard students only. Of course, Allegro versus eBay for geography. The second type of launch market, or MDM, is a market that doesn't really look like a market to start with. And a good example here is LinkedIn. So if you think about it, they started as an online community for professionals. And who would have thought that they will eat the recruitment market at one point? The two key things here is to make sure that you still have network effects in your core product. So in LinkedIn's case, the more profiles you have, the more engagement, the better the product for everyone. And the second thing is your initial use case or your product value is not directly related to the ultimate market. Because again, in, in LinkedIn's case, if some of the big recruitment guys knew what's happening and what the end game was for LinkedIn, they would have killed it in day one. So as you can see, there's many ways to slice and dice your market and to pick a small niche. But pick wisely because you need to have one that can serve as a logical wedge into an adjacent market or something much bigger. So in, in other words, the bolt here on this slide, the best sub-market or launch market will end up eating the whole market. So here's a summary of the playbook for the grassroots and under the radar screen approach. Attempt to dominate your initial small niche or the MVM. Experiment with little capital in that niche market. You will probably be alone there anyway. Until you find real product market fit. Keep it as much under the radar as possible. There is no upside of being onto TechCrunch right now. Once you have your real product market fit, then scale like crazy. And once you have your dominance in that small niche, use that as a wedge to go into an adjacent market and own the whole thing. Attack the incumbents. It's all yours. Now on to post-liquidity. So we talk about network effects as having moats. Yes, they make your castle highly defensible. No one can touch you. And that is indeed the case. So dominant marketplaces, dominant network effect businesses rarely get displaced by someone attacking them frontally. But they are vulnerable. And they are vulnerable to lateral attacks. This is something we touched on on the previous slides with the MVMs. So as a dominant player, once you're there, once you have critical mass, don't, don't just sit there and milk it and celebrate it. Be very paranoid. 
even if it's a small player, a tiny one, even if it's something that's not totally related to what you do, remotely related even, you have to know them, you have to be aware of them. And here, you have to be willing to sacrifice short-term unit economics. And even better, very often it makes sense to consider M&A to consol consolidate liquidity, but also to bear hug the lateral attackers. Final lesson, and we're al almost there, <laughs> hold, <laughs> hold on tight. Uh, not all network effect businesses uh, or network effects are created equal. And there's this notion of shallow versus deep. And here, you know, it's, it's really quite simple. Shallow is a network effect that tails off after a certain point of liquidity. And the question to ask is, and it, this really depends on the type of business you are, you know, B2C, B2B, uh, etc. But does, for example, user number 10,000 add the same amount of value as my user 100 did? And it's okay to have shallow network effects. You're still a marketplace, you're still a network effect business, it's not a deal breaker. You just have to be mindful of it because you're not as defensible as you might think. It's actually much easier for someone else to catch up with you because of your shallow network effects. Now, now that we know that, <laughs> what are some of the characteristics that make for deep network effects or like the strong form of network effects? Well, variety of product and services is one. And even better, very diverse and complex characteristics of these products and services. So a very good example here is hotel book, uh, is uh, restaurant booking. Let's say I need a table at 7.30 for four people here in this particular area of Warsaw for a um, Chinese restaurant, let's say. I want it to be good reviews and I need a good vegetarian option as well for one of my friends. There's so many requests in one particular um, booking. And if you think about this platform, and we all know which platform that is, they need to have all the liquidity of the, all the Chinese restaurants in this area for me to have a good experience. So that is basically a deep network effect. You need everything because maybe next week I need a Peruvian. So, And final point here about the different network effects. Don't confuse local and global network effects. Again, let's say I'm a person that lives in London and I, I don't travel that much. So technically, I don't really care about the amount of drivers and the liquidity that Uber has in Birmingham or a city in Germany or even Warsaw. I really don't care. And actually, I can take it even further from there. I, in fact, in this big place that London is, only care about several areas, really. I, you know, where I work, where I live, where I go out, potentially one or two more. That's the, that's, these are the areas I care. So from a user point of view, my network effects in Uber are very, very local. And contrast that with one of our portfolio companies which sells very rare cars. It's only 20 of them ever produced. And let's say I'm a buyer in, sitting in London. I will not look for this car in London, of course. I need global liquidity because maybe there's only two on the market right now, one in Dubai, one in Mexico. So this particular platform needs global network effects from day one. And with that in mind, think about the network effects you're after or the network effects you want to build and de devise or design the trade mechanism accordingly. Don't just copy paste the basic trade mechanism because these days, um, Facilitating supply and demand discovery is no, no, longer, uh, if, you know, no, no longer sufficient. You still need to think about the basics, yes. But try to, be, to go a few levels further. So what are the characteristics of the underlying trade? The degree of standardization, uh, the motivations of the participants, w what are the characteristics of the industry? What does the supply chain look like? Who gets what margin along the chain? Uh, what is the degree of fragmentation? What are the information and trust requirements of the participants? And with that, whoops, and we're done, basically. <laughs> that was the
Hi. Thanks for the presentation. In interesting. I'm just wondering. We're working in. in uh, we're building this marketplace in a B two B, and um, and it's quite and it's enterprise sales. So I'm just wondering if you could, if if you know. If, so, so for us, the liquidity or this, you know, occasional buying is is not the thing. We're working on a long term contract in enterprise sales. I'm just wondering if you know some good uh, examples of modes built in this type of environment. So that's all. As you said, long-term contracts is one way of make it, making your clients very sticky uh, because molds are all about capturing one side or the other side or maybe both. Um, so if they are in long-term contracts, you, you have them captive. This is a great example of being defensible. Mm -hmm. I, I would say, <laughs> if, that, if that helps. Um. All right, let me meditate on that. Thanks. <laughs> Boję się, że kogoś trafię. Fa thanks, Mira. Um, could you like um, show the examples of successful usage of network effects, like uh, at least one or two from your portfolio, that um, like some use cases that it really worked, and what type of network effects was it? Um, Sure, uh, I can give quite a few examples. So one of the examples I didn't cover, uh, which was on the slides, we have a, a company called Fanduo, which is a um, fantasy league. And there we saw this aggressive approach of liquidity buying. So our company was out there, beautiful unit economics, market leader, um, and there's DraftKings coming in with lots of funding, literally giving discounts. Uh, left, right, and center, undercutting our guys, and they caught up, and they actually are now, it's a duopoly. So this is an example of a network effects that is probably not as deep if you can steal people away with discounts and, you know, subsidizing your way in. That's not, not you know, a good example of very deep and very sticky. And, it, and you can see why. Obviously, some of the users are multi-homing. And that you see with also with ride sharing, with other platforms. If you can use multiple apps, then you have a problem. Um, and then I think our team was obviously um, involved with QXL Ricardo here in, in Poland. They were running it um, before that went and kind of became Allegro. And there was a great example of eBay coming uh, from the US and saying, hey guys, list for free, buy for free. But they couldn't make it because Allegro at this point was such a dominant play. You had to be absolutely crazy to post on eBay. No one will look at your ad there because there's no liquidity. So th this is an example of a very deep entrenched network effect. Once you have all the traffic of buyers, all the traffic of sellers, even with undercutting at this point, it was very difficult to, to, to fight it. Um, even eBay, which is a strong brand, so they had to retrench. Um, and yeah, I think th th those were a few examples. Uh, okay, so what are three characteristics of a seed stage startup that you would be most excited about uh, with investing? Sure, so we really like dominance in a small niche. It can be a very tiny market, but if you already have 5-10% market share, and it's not difficult, it's not unheard of if you're going after a very small market, then you have something special going for, for you. Uh, because you will get to that critical level where you will be untouchable in your small castle, and from there, if there is a wedge to something bigger, we will be super excited, as I said. Um, the other thing, of course, is high usage. Um, if it's a, you know, we're talking about B2C, if people really come back and you see that people like it, then of course there's a real value prop. If it's a B2B, high wallet share, because then you see that your clients really need to use you. And, and actually even better, once you start hitting certain market share, very often with a marketplace that has B2B, you see clients saying, you know what, I'm not going to pay anymore, this is too expensive, they leave, and then they come back a few weeks later. And this actually is a great indicator that you have something very special going for you. Okay, 
Yeah. Thanks a lot, Mira.